What happens to metals when they're at 1700 degrees C being hit by sunlight and particle radiation? How do you know it won't just evaporate? How do you convince NASA and reviewers that it will actually survive? The sun is one of the most fascinating mysteries in our solar system. And thanks to the Parker Solar Probe, we may start to understand it a little better. The plan is to send a spacecraft to the sun's corona to measure the electric and magnetic fields, image the solar wind, and collect high-energy solar particles. Then it will send back the solar data to help researchers better forecast solar flare activity and how that might affect us here on Earth. The probe team needed to prove that their instruments could withstand the harsh conditions of the sun. Justin Casper is responsible for the probe's Faraday cup, which is designed to scoop up the solar wind. So a French colleague of mine in Paris said, you know, okay, meet me in Perpignan, which is a small town uh, on, the, uh, on the coast in southern France. So like a couple months later, I hop on a plane, I fly down there and I meet him. We hop in a car. Three hours later, we're up in the Pyrenees. Get out of the car, there's a half a foot of snow. I'm in shorts, miserable. But we're looking at the largest solar furnace in the world. The Odeo Solar Furnace is located in the Pyrenees Mountains in southern France. There are 63 mirrors on the mountainside that reflect the sun's rays to a seven-story parabolic structure fitted with 10,000 mirrors. The solar rays are then reflected and focused to a central tower. My colleague and the people that work there said, come with a prototype of your instrument, stick it in this chamber, and we'll expose it up to you know the full amount of sunlight it would experience at closest approach. We'll heat it to the full temperatures, we can simultaneously hit it with the radiation it will experience close to the sun, and we'll do it for you for free. And they showed me a memorandum from the 1970s, and it said, uh, you know, we the French uh, space agency would love to be involved in the solar probe one day if it ever happens. So here's the agreement we've made. We're gonna go off and we're gonna figure out how you can show uh, these things can survive this kind of extreme environment. And if one day, solar probe really happens and you want to design these instruments, you come to us and, and we will have a facility where you can test these materials. And so they'd been waiting for like 40 years for someone to show up and say, you know, okay, I've got it. And so it was a wonderful experience. In the end, they wound up testing uh, more than 300 different material samples for us, um, you know, all using this light bouncing off these mirrors in the Pyrenees. NASA needed further testing to ensure the probe could withstand days of exposure to the solar elements in space. So we're just three months away from the launch of Parker Solar Probe. We have one last test to do for our instruments on the spacecraft, and that's to take our qualification model of the Solar Probe Cup, put it in this chamber behind me, and simulate an encounter with the sun. Researchers put the Faraday cup in a vacuum chamber and blasted it with light and radiation as powerful as the sun. Then the team bought four used IMAX film projectors on eBay and hacked them to create the intense focused light. If you look at an old school analog 70 millimeter IMAX film projector that has a bulb full of xenon, it heats up to about the same temperature as the surface of the sun. We have to combine four projectors to get the total amount of sunlight and the, the angular size of the sun correctly. But we shine that merged sunlight in through this uh, window into the chamber and illuminate the instrument with it. Outside the vacuum chamber, we have this uh, dull looking metal box here, which is actually a replica of the spacecraft. So the instrument actually thinks it's on the spacecraft, talking to the spacecraft, sending it telemetry. We're, we're now very much simulating the real sun environment. Uh, the next steps, now that the chamber pressure is dropping, uh, we can bring our IN gun or particle accelerator on and see if the instrument functions. So now that we've turned on the instrument, it's reporting internal diagnostics. And one of the things we're seeing is the electronics are actually pretty warm. We really don't have a, a lot of time to do our test before the electronics uh, risk overheating. So we're gonna have to move pretty quickly. Chamber pressure is a little on the high side, which is fine, but the particle accelerator actually has its own circuit that won't allow us to enable the accelerator if it thinks the pressure is too high. So we've got to basically flip a switch to override that interlock device so we can turn the particle accelerator on. 
Meanwhile, the temperature of the electronics box keeps rising. We managed to just correctly reprogram the interlock so the particle accelerator is not being inhibited from uh, turning on. We're going to set up a data display so as the instrument scans through voltage, uh, we'll see if there's a, uh, an ion beam or not. Nope. Hey! All right. <laughs> ah, look at that. Beautiful. That's a nice, really strong signal if you look. Uh, you know, the signal's coming in really clear, really strong, coming in at the exact same uh, energy uh, every time. And we've reached a point where the instrument is able to outperform the conditions that the chamber is capable of recreating, um, which is about as good as it gets. What more do you want when you're trying to show that an instrument's going to operate in an extreme environment than to build the best test facility you can to recreate that environment and then see if the instrument's able to outperform that? Yeah, we're going to the sun. We're going to the sun. Ah, that's exciting. <laughs>